Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. We're in the last, last lesson, the last exhortation in the book of, of Hebrews. And so I want you to look at these words in Hebrews chapter 13, just a, a short verse 22, please. And I beseech you, brethren, Hebrews 13, 22, I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I've written a letter unto you in a few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he shall come shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. One of the reasons we do believe it's written by Paul, at least I believe it's written by Paul, is Paul's waiting for Timothy to come. He has, again, bad eyesight toward the end of his life, and Timothy is able, hopefully, to be able to bring Paul with him. Timothy, obviously, at this point, must have been confined also for a period of time, but he has been set at liberty. Uh, he is already free now, and he will be coming to Paul, and hopefully Paul will be able to travel with him to be able to see these folks that he's writing to in the book of Hebrews. But the word we're talking about today is the word of exhortation in verse 22. I'm going to be dealing with, I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. I want to talk to you about that one. Very important passage, I think, to end this word. It kind of sums up the entire book as Paul has written many, many words in this book, but he says they're just few compared to the word of exhortation. Notice the word exhortation is singular. Suffer the word, singular of exhortation. I've written a few words to you, but I want you to suffer this word. Of all the words that he has written to them, the word of exhortation is very important that they understand it, that they apply it, that they not only hear God's word, but they heed God's word. Before I get to that, though, by way of an introduction, I want to share with you three words that are oftentimes used together, and I want to share with you a little bit of the differences between the words. The first word I want you to understand is edify. We're going to look at edify, encourage, and, and exhort, and I want you to explain the difference that the Bible uses with these words. The first one is the word edify, wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also you do. I want you to edify one another. Everyone in this church needs to be edified. The word edify really needs to be built up, to be built up. And it comes from oikodomio, which is oikos, house. You've heard of oikos, the yogurt, oikos. It just literally means house. And domeo, which means to build. So when you, when you put those words together to build the house, it really means to build up. And people on this earth are torn down, especially if you're believers in Christ. You are looked upon as being an imbecile as being very unintelligent because you still accept the Bible as the word of God. And we get beat up outside in this world, and when we come into church, we really need to have people edify one another, to build each other up, to encourage and strengthen one another. But building each other up is really important. Now, I'll tell you what, I, I had the blessing years and years ago when I started here at Calvary, after I was welding for six years, I got a call here at Calvary to come and become the youth pastor back 34 years ago, and I worked with a man by the name of Marv Luco, because when I got to Calvary Baptist Church, we were building a new building. They built a new extension or new addition on the old property, and every day I'd come with my shirt and tie on, because I was taught that in seminary or in Bible college, to wear a suit and tie, and Glenn Armstrong would say, you're working with Marv today. I ruined more clothes working with Marv today. So I ended up putting a set of clothes behind the door. So I'd come into work, and you're working with Marv today. I spent many, 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 many days working with Marv Lukow, who was a Finnish carpenter who did everything perfect. If you knew Marv, he was incredible. When they, they came to, to tape our building, the tapers came in and said, we've never seen anything like this. Every screw is in the exact same place. 
Every screw is exactly turned in the same direct, same amount in the sheetrock. It is perfect, absolutely perfect. <laughs> and Marv would take a template and he would put a little hole in the sheetrock where every screw had to go. So it was actually exactly perfect. But it was just un unbelievable to work with this guy. And we did all the trim work in the church and he taught me so many things. But you get a, an enjoyment. I'll tell you what, don't you love the smell of wood? Men? Maybe some women? Don't you love just going into Menards, just walking through the wood just to do it? Just because it smells good? I mean, you have such an appreciation for carpentry. You can take this piece of wood and you can make it into a support for your garbage can. Or you can take this same wood <coughs> and you can build some piece of heirloom furniture from it. It is not in the wood. The wood has tremendous potential. It's in the eye of the carpenter. And when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came as a carpenter. The word edify has to do with carpentry. It is supporting, strengthening, and closing from elements that are around you, providing security, making a place of peace, making a sanctuary. It is doing all of that in the life of people. Now again, it's wonderful to build things out of wood. But what Paul is talking about is building things into people's lives and building them up, strengthening them, supporting them, providing them with shelter and security from, from the people around, the world around us. And that's what church is all about. Once you understand, be also before we get to that, Jude 120, which is the book just before the book of Revelation, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Faith, again, is the foundation. You build on that, on that foundation. But before we can build the lives of others, we really need to be edified ourselves. We need to get into the word of God and have God's word strengthen us, support us, give us the, the, the shelter that we need. And that comes primarily built upon the foundation that we have in, in faith in Christ. The second word I want you to share with you is the word encouragement. Now, having said that, the word encouragement, this is an Old Testament word. It's only used one time in the New Testament, the word encourage, as far as English word. And it's only used when the Apostle Paul was, had been through that shipwreck. He had finally made it to, uh, to Italy, and he was at the Appia, for, Appia Way in the, the, the three taverns, and he was encouraged in the way, he said. Well, that's the only time the word encouragement is ever used in the New Testament. But the word encouragement is used many, many times in the Old Testament. The word for encouragement is used like 67 times in the Old Testament. 17 times it's translated to give courage to encouragement. But in Deuteronomy 3.28, but charge Joshua and encourage him, strengthen him. He should go over before this people. He will cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. I want you to charge Joshua. I want you to encourage him. I want you to strengthen him. Now again, that's a very strong Old Testament principle that we need to have courage placed within us. One of the big problems that we have as church people, as members of a church, is we are afraid. We're afraid to share Christ with anybody. We're afraid to tell people about what Christ has done. We're afraid to get up in front. We're afraid to teach. We're afraid to sing. There's a lot of fear that goes on in the church in using our gifts. But God wants us to be filled with courage because he will strengthen us. He will give us the, the power that we need. Now, having said that, edification may be a part of encouragement, but it's not encouragement. Encouragement may be a part of exhortation, but exhortation is not the same thing as encouragement. Again, encouragement is translated 48 times, but 17 times translated courage in the Old Testament. I want you to take your Bible, please, and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 14. Hold your place in Hebrews, of course. But 1 Samuel, I just wanted to give you an illustration in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 14. Let's read a part of this. I think it's very interesting. Verse 1, it came to pass on a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul said to the young man that bear his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that's on the other side, he told not his father. Now, please understand, everybody, all the Israelites are hiding. <laughs> they don't have any weapons. Jonathan is the only one that has a weapon. Everyone's hiding in caves and in dens of the rock, 
They won't show themselves. They're afraid. But Jonathan wants to go and show himself to the Philistines. It says in verse Verse 4, in between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over, there was a Pharisee's garrison. There was a sharp rock on one side and the sharp rock on the other side. The name of the one rock was Boses. The name of the other was Senna. The forefront was one was situated northward over against Michmash. The other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young men that bear his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Gulp, do all that's in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thine heart. Then said Jonathan, I get a kick out of this, behold, we'll pass over to these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say to us, tarry until we come to you, then we'll stand still in our place, we'll not go up to them. But if they say to us, come up unto us, then we'll go up for the Lord to deliver them into our hand. <laughs> this shall be assigned unto us. And I'm just thinking, if I'm the armor bearer, Really? Really, that's your sign? I mean, the, the wet fleece on the ground was a lot better sign. You know, the ground dry, the fleet wet, the fleet dry, the ground wet. That was a lot better. This is, there's only two op options here. You know, the, Pharisee, the, the garrison of the Philistines is either going to say, come up or, or stay. The garrison is thinking, if we go up to them, they'll just hide and we won't find them. Or they'll run. Or they have an ambush there for some of us or something. So what are they going to say? I mean, if you're going to use your logic, they don't want to chase two guys. All the Israelites are fleeing, hiding in dens. They show themselves. The Philistines, more than likely, are going to say, hey, come on up here, we'll show you a thing. They're not afraid of these two men. And ah, that's a sign. The Lord hath delivered them into our hands. And I'm thinking if I'm the armor bearer, you've got to be kidding. You've got 20 some guys here against one guy with a sword and I've got a shield and we're going to go up and fight with them? But I get such a kick out of this armor bearer because the armor bearer, he says in verse 7, do all that's in thine heart turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. This armor bearer is incredible. Now, when I think of an encourager, it is so incredible to have someone to come alongside of you. You say, I'd like to do this. Hey, we can do that. Come on, let's go do it together. Man, when you've got someone who will come alongside of you and say, come on, I'll go with you. That is so cool. That is so great. Hey, let's go call on the people that live around our church. Let's pass out flyers. Any of you want to do that? You want to go knock on doors? How about if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I'll go with you. Let's go do it. I tell you what, from a pastor's point of view, that is so much easier. I've been the pastor here for about almost 19 years now. And in that time that I've been a pastor here in this church, uh, I've had someone go on visitation with me almost all of that time except for the last year. I've had someone who's been willing to go on visitation on Thursday nights with me every Thursday night for about the last 17, 18 years except for this past year. And I want you to understand this. It is so much better when you've got someone who wants to go on visitation with you, who wants to get up on Thursday night and say, Pastor, I'll go with you. What time do you want to meet? Well, let's meet at church at 7 o'clock. It does two things. It obligates me. I'm going to find someone for us to go visit. We're going to go visit someone on Thursday night. Number two, it's a whole lot easier to go call on someone that you don't know. And you say, I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine. This is a man from our church. And we're here to, and I, of course, share the name. And then we go and, and, and visit them. And a lot of times they'll invite us in. We'll go and talk to them. And it's, it's tremendous. It is so nice to have someone come alongside Second thing that's really nice is when you have someone in agreement. You may have a deacon meeting and you have an opinion that you share your opinion and there's a lot of difference of opinion but if you have some guy in that church, some guy on that deacon board that's a spirit-filled man who is close to the Lord, who spends time in prayer and he says to him, says to all the deacons, you know, I agree with the pastor. 
I've been praying about this, and I think this is something we should do as well. Wow. That is really encouraging. The third thing I want you to understand is if you have something, if you know something's from God, I want you to look in your Bible. Just turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. And you'll see what I'm saying here in this passage. <coughs> David was greatly distressed, and the speak, people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man. Did, did you just read that? David's men were talking about stoning David, their leader. Why? Because they were so distressed because the Amalekites had come in and destroyed Ziklag, their city, and taken their children and their wives captive. And they were afraid, every man for his daughter, for his sons. In the end of the verse, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. There was no one to encourage David. But I want you to understand verse 7. And David said to Abiathar the priest, and Abimelech's son, I pray thee, bring hither the ephod. Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord. There's nothing more encouraging to you when you know that God has asked you to do something. You know it. You know this is of God. When God speaks to you and you know that he says, Dwight, I want you to go to Duluth and I want you to work in that church. Dwight, I want you to move down to Rochester. I want you to work in that church. You know that's of God. You know that he has called you and you just say, yes, Lord. And you're encouraged because God is at work. And it doesn't matter, folks, if you have a car broke down. Or you don't, it doesn't matter if your house floods with sewage. If you know that God is behind it, that it's gone through his throne first, and he has said, approve for Dwight Lapine. This is good for him. I want him to go through this. It doesn't matter. If you're doing what God wants you to do, then you're encouraged. It doesn't bother you if you know that God is behind it. It really bothers you if you don't know that God's behind it. If you don't know that God is in it. So the first point of my outline, please, if you turn back to Hebrews chapter 13, it just... I want you to explain to you what the word exhortation means now with the third word. We talked about edification. We talked about encouragement. I want to share with you the difference between those two words. I want to share with you what, what the word exhortation means. To start off with, I want you to look at the word suffer, the word of exhortation. Suffer it. Allow that to happen. Now, friends, he would not have to say suffer edification, suffer encouragement. You don't have to say that. You want encouragement. You want edification. You want someone to edify you. But exhortation is not the same. It's not the same as encouragement or edification. Now, that may be part of it, but that's not it. Exhortation is a strong urging, a beseeching, as he says in this verse. The word edification or the word exhortation in this verse is the word parakaleo, Parakletos, parakaleo means to call, usually out loud, therefore to urge strongly, to beseech. Para, alongside of, kaluo, to call. Listen, I don't care if you know Greek. It doesn't matter to me about Greek, but this is an important word. It's used all the time in the New Testament. When the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete, the comforter, the word paraclete is the Greek word for comforter, when he's called the comforter, it just simply means the Holy Spirit is the one called alongside of us. He comes up alongside of us. There's a strong calling to us. There's a beseeching. There's an urging. And that's what he means when he says it in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. You could translate it, I beg you, therefore, brethren. I urge you, therefore, brethren. It is the word parakaleo. He says the same word that's used here in the word exhortation. The word exhortation, of course, is a noun, but it's to exhort is a verb. It's the same word, parakaleo. Now, again, ed exhortation is encouragement, it's edification, but it also includes rebuking. Exhortation is something not to believe, but something to obey. Exhortation is a strong urging to obey to practice, to put into your life, to do, not just what you believe. 
permit it to bear with it. Now, please understand, when you look at this word here, 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when they will not endure. That's the same word that's used in Hebrews 13, the word suffer. It's the same word. Now, you can understand a little bit of what he's saying in Hebrews 13. I want you to endure at exhortation. I want you to endure it. I want you to suffer it. Friends, there are many, many churches out there right now that you can go to and get exhortation. I'm sorry, which you can get edification and you can get encouragement. There are many, many churches out there that do not preach doctrine because doctrine divides. Doctrine is divisive. So rather than divide the church, let's just talk about loving Jesus. Let's just talk about what value, the benefits, Christianity is to your life. And it's all about benefits. If you want to build a church, you need to talk about benefits. How does Christianity benefit you? Now, friends, there's nothing wrong with talking about benefits. But there's a lot wrong if that's the only thing you talk about. When people will no longer endure sound doctrine, people will not endure it. And I think when Paul writes this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he's talking about the time period that we live in. That it's really easy to talk about Jesus. It's really easy to talk about loving one another. But to talk about doctrine, doctrine has to be endured. It's not easy to talk about doctrine. Doctrine is divisive. People come up, why are there so many churches? Why are there the Methodists, the Presbyterian, the Baptists? It's because doctrine is divisive. And so when you start teaching doctrine, my doctrine's different than your doctrine, then therefore we have two different churches. If our doctrine is the same, we have one church. Now again, if we want to have a huge church where all of these churches come together, we forget about doctrine because all of our doctrine is the same. It doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you believe in Jesus, we will all come together. And that's the way that people are today. Again, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And again, that idea here is teachers who are teaching what you want to hear. Well, what, what did you need? What do you want? Oh, I can do that. I can teach on that. You, you want me to teach on the Vikings? I can teach on the Minnesota Vikings. I, I know a lot about the Vikings. I can teach on hunting. I can teach on hunting. And so you have teachers that have itching ears that teach. Now listen to me carefully. Exhortation is not hearing what you want to hear. Exhortation is hearing what you need to hear. And there's a big difference between hearing what you want to hear and hearing what you need to hear. That's what the remote is all about. When you're at home in, on your couch and you're going through the channels, that is not about hearing what you, want, what you need to hear. It's hearing about what you want to hear. And you go until you find what you want to hear. That's what the remote is about. And you keep clicking on it. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that. I want to hear ah, I want to hear that. And you find what you want to hear. Gilligan's Island. No, I'm kidding you. But it's just easier to listen to, easier to, you don't have to think. No one wants to think. You have to endure thinking. And so it's much easier to, to just sit and listen to a story than it is to listen to truth. You can understand what he says here. When, the, when this passage says, but they will turn them aside unto fables, the Bible says. And again, Christianity has been turned aside unto fables today where everything is about storytelling and everyone wants to hear stories, but the truth is very difficult to understand. Now, exhortation is an awful lot about enduring. Exhortation is a lot about enduring. Again, there's a difference between what we, we want to hear and what we need to hear. And by the way, when I say America 2016, that's what politicians are all about. In the last 20 years, that's what they've all been about is what do the people want to hear? What do the polls say the people want? If the polls say that's what the people want, if I'm going to get elected, I've got to tell the people what they want to hear. And that's what America's been about for a long time. Now, you don't have to agree with that, but I'm right. <laughs> but I'm right. And again, if you find a statesman who will tell you what you need to hear, that's not popular. 
that we have a $19.5 trillion deficit, that we need to raise taxes, we need to cut spending. That's not popular. That's not going to get you elected, right? So we need to do something different. We'll spend more money and we'll lower taxes. Some fun. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun. We can do that. Anyway, having said that, Hebrews 3.13, here's some of the ways that exhortation is used. And again, I want you to understand, exhortation, yes, edification, encouragement, but it's more than that. It is a rebuke. It is a conviction. It is an urging. It's a prodding. If you look at how it's used in the book of Hebrews, exhort one another daily while it's called the day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Understand, sin will be deceitful and it will harden you. If you sin the same sin long enough, it won't be a problem to you anymore. You will find a reason why it's not that big of a deal. You can imagine the Hebrews that we're talking about here, the multitude of the sacrifices made sin very common. Everybody's sinning these sins. Everybody's bringing a lamb. Everybody's killing a lamb. Everybody's killing a pigeon for a sin offering, a trespass offering. I'm not the only one. And it was actually an encouragement to sin because I can't stop it anyway. And all God seems to want is another turtle dove or a pigeon or maybe a lamb if I have enough, enough money. That's all God wants, so I'll just take another lamb and I'll offer that and I'll just go back to sinning again because that's what I do. That's what I do best. But what God is saying in the book of Hebrews, which is a strong warning, I want you to exhort one another so you wouldn't be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, friends, listen, that's not the same as edification. That's not the same as encouragement. We all need encouragement. We all need edification. But this has a lot to do with the sin in my life that someone's going to exhort me so I wouldn't be hardened through that sin. So I'd learn to be soft and, tense and sensitive to what I am doing in my heart and in my life so I wouldn't get hardened to this stuff. So someone would come up to me and say, you know, that's wrong. What you did there was wrong. I, to I told you about my dad that time that I had the seventh day Adventist come to my cabin and, and uh, he... He came and he started teaching me about Seventh-day Adventists and I had just gone to Bible college and I knew Seventh-day Adventists. I knew the doctrine and I blew him out of the water. Yeah, yeah. Blew him out of the water. He left there and I felt so good about it. And my dad was sitting, sitting there listening to me and he said, you know, you really embarrassed me on that one. My dad said that to me. You really embarrassed me. That's not how you treat people. You know, he does matter to God. And, oh, man, <laughs> That took me from thinking I was really something to being nothing in about one half second, realizing that my dad was right. And that's not how you treat people. Even if they have wrong doctrine, that's not how you treat them. And again, what that does to you is it makes you sense, sensitive and tender toward what's going on in your life, that you don't treat people that way. By the way, Hebrews chapter 13, we need to enter into a, into a place of rest. There is a place of rest, and we are talking about even believers could be living in unbelief. Even believers could be living in unbelief, and that's what we're looking at in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Because of unbelief, they couldn't enter into the rest. They, they left Egypt. They had Christ. They had God. He was providing their needs, but they didn't have faith that he was able to take them into that promised land. The second use of exhortation in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 25. Let us consider one another, provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a man or some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let's get together more, not less. We need to get together more because we see the day approaching, because the day of, that Christ is coming is so close and we need to get out and share the gospel. We need to see people saved. We need to have holy lives because Christ is coming. We need that. Because we need that, we need to be exhorted. And we need to be exhorted all the time. We need to exhort one another. Now I want you to understand in context, the word provoke is very similar 
You understand, exhort Pericleo to call to one side, provoke Latin, vocas to call, to call forth. Now what church do you want to go to? You want to go to the church that encourages you or provokes you? How would you like it if I said, I'm going to provoke you? You want to be provoked today? We're going to provoke you. Listen, provoke does not sound that good. Provoke sounds like inciting to riot. Provoke is, <laughs> it sounds painful. It sounds like the pig that won't go into the sty and has this sharp object poking him to get him to go into this, this uh, pig sty or whatever. Understand, I believe in the church of provoking to call forth the prod. Friends, we don't necessarily like provoking. I like encouraging a lot better. Let's go to the first church of encouragement. Let's not go to the first church of provoking. But the Bible is clear that we need to provoke one another to love and to good works because we are seeing the day come. Now, let's just think about this. Let's think what it would be like. Jesus Christ comes back. He comes back. The rapture takes place. You're in heaven. Now, what were you doing when the rapture took place? Well, I was on a street corner passing out flyers and tracts. And Jesus Christ came right when I was sharing the gospel with someone. And I'm in heaven. I was reading my Bible at the kitchen table and I was studying it and I was praying and Jesus came back. Isn't that great? Don't you love it? You know, there's going to be ser servants, a lot of servants that are not prepared for his coming. But wouldn't it be something if you were prepared when he came back? And you were doing as well when he came back. And Jesus Christ ushers you and he says, the first thing he says, well done, <laughs> well done. Faithful, good servant. Now, would you appreciate at that point a church that provoked you to love and to good works? Would you appreciate a church that exhorted you? Would you appreciate a church that didn't just tell you what you wanted to hear, but heard it had a church that actually told you what you needed to hear? And they provoked you to do love and to good works, and you were doing good works when Christ came back. Opposite side of the coin. Here you're down there, and you're watching some television program. You've been to church once a week, and you haven't seen your Bible for a week, and Jesus Christ come back, and you're watching the show on television you probably shouldn't have been watching, and you're up with, with the Lord. But you went to church, and it was a, a church that you enjoyed. I, I'm telling you, the job that we have as a church and as people in a church is not just simply to edify, to encourage. We need to provoke to love and to good works. It's part of what God asks us to do. Third one, Hebrews 12, 5. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. You have forgotten the exhortation. What kind of exhortation were we talking about? Well, it's the kind of exhortation a father for a son, that, that a father spanks his child. It's not necessarily pleasant to be spanked. That's the kind of exhortation that we're talking about. Do you see in the book of Hebrews... That exhortation is not always fun. It's not always pleasant. Sometimes it's spanking. Sometimes it may be painful. Sometimes it may be prodding. Sometimes it may be rebuking. Now, I said to you earlier that the Holy Spirit, parakletos, called alongside of, he is the comforter. That's a great word. I love that word. But when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit's job is not just to comfort. It's also to convict. And he convicts me all the time. It's his job. It's the Holy Spirit's job to come inside of me to grieve when I fall into sin. To be quenched when I disobey him. But the Holy Spirit does not remain quiet. He continually prods me. He continually exhorts me. He is not a silent guest. And part of the process is spanking because the very next verse, as, as you know, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. Don't forget that exhortation. <laughs> 
just rehearsing this the moment. My dad used to spank me. I loved my dad. My dad, I didn't love his belt, though. I didn't love when he pulled my hair. He used to grab me by the hair until he cut all my hair off, and then he tried grabbing, and he couldn't grab it. That was a lot better when I didn't have any hair. But my dad had a temper. But I want you to understand this. My dad hit me with a belt a couple times. I always deserved it. Always deserved it. Throwing rocks at your sister and hitting them, that grounds for a spanking, you know? I went down with a croquet mallet behind my dad's house. I don't know what possessed me, but I chopped down all the trees. Now listen, they didn't fall down. I just killed all the bark around every one of them. Now, when you kill all the bark around the trees, you know what happens to the trees? The tree dies. Well, those were the trees that held up my dad's cabin. And so he didn't like that. <laughs> the time that I left the motor on the boat in the water, when it rained five inches and the motor, the boat sank underwater, the motor sank underwater, my dad didn't like that. <laughs> and I do remember those things. I always deserved it. I, was all, I always deserved when, God, when, when my dad spanked me. But to this day, I am very thankful. I'm very thankful that my dad taught me to take care of things, that he taught me to work hard, that he taught me to think before I did something. I'm thankful for that. You know, my dad's with the Lord right now in heaven. I'm glad for that. But at the, I'm, I'm telling you that it's one of the exhortations a father does for his child. And that's what I am to do, that's what you are to do in this church. The last one, suffer the word of exhortation. I've written a letter to you in a few words. Now again, we have looked at the book of Hebrews. It's many warnings in this book. Don't go back to that old covenant. Jesus Christ is far better. Submit to Christ. Draw near to him. Suffer the word of exhortation. Now let me just stop here and just close by this. You know, there's an awful lot about Christianity out there. But if you don't understand the first and most important part of Christianity is Christ. There's an awful lot about Christianity out there, but if you're missing Christ, you're missing everything. Christianity is not about church. It's not about hard work. It's not about doing everything. It's about a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's about drawing near to him. It's about coming and confessing your sins before him and drawing near to the throne of grace. It's about being a part of fellowship with him. The reason we come to church, well, someone hurt me in that church. I'm not going back. I understand. But God designed the church to be a place where we will meet with him. It's his body. He designed it as a place where we would get to know him better, where we could fellowship with him, where we could come before him, we could draw close to him. It's designed by God. We didn't design this. God designed this, and he is saying to us in the book of Hebrews, I want you to suffer the word of exhortation. Don't forsake the assembling yourself together as a man or some is. But Christianity is not about do's and don'ts it's about a person and when you look at the book of hebrews there's all the old testament sacrifices all the ordinances there's the sabbath days there's the new moon all those things but we have something that is so much greater in the book of hebrews and it is about jesus christ he is far better than anything you had in the old testament but if you miss the point of the book of hebrews the book of hebrews is not about substituting a new set of ordinances or an old set of ordinances it's not about the church versus the temple. It's not about being a Christian rather than being Jewish. That's not the point. It's the same person that has walked with man throughout the entire Bible. He wasn't born in Bethlehem. He's always been. That God, that Jesus Christ, our Savior, he was with them in the Old Testament. He was the rock. He was the one they, they, they walked with and followed. And God has asked us to put our trust in him as our salvation for our Savior. And he's asked us to draw close to him and fellowship with him. 
And that's what Christianity is all about. It's about a person. It's about coming close to him and drawing close to him and asking him for strength, for support, for encouragement, and that we would obey him, that we would obey him and do what he's asked us to do. I'd like to have your head bowed, your eyes closed real quickly, and again, just by way of remembrance, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, if you're not certain you have eternal life, salvation is the most important message in the Bible, that Jesus Christ loved you so much that he died on the cross for you. You cannot save yourself. You can't have eternal life by your good works. You can't have eternal life by your baptism. That'll never get you to heaven. You cannot have eternal life by your church. There is not a church out there that's the Savior. There's only one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. He died on the cross for our sins. He offers us a gift of eternal life if we would receive it. He's not going to force you to do that, but he just gives you a simple choice, and you pray a simple prayer, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died on the cross for me. I can't save myself the best I know how. I want to put my trust in you as the one who died for me on the cross. I want to receive you as my Savior. And if you earnestly, sincerely desire Christ as your Savior, God promises to forgive you of your sins, to give you eternal life. Once again, we want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.